Good morning, everybody. My name is Mo Olathe, and I am executive director of Georgetown University's Institute of Politics and Public Service at our McCord School of Public Policy. And I want to welcome everybody to today's uh, series of events on Transition 2020. We're proud to be partnering with Brunswick <clears throat> to put together this, uh, what we hope will be an exciting and informative three-part event looking at the transition, not just uh, this year, but uh, looking back over time uh, at how transitions typically our, are, are conducted uh, through the voices of people who have been there. Today, um, we're gonna be hearing three different panels kicking off this morning with a panel on building a new administration, looking at the nuts and bolts of how to put together a new government. In a few hours at 10.30, we will reconvene for a conversation on the confirmation process. And then closing it out this afternoon with a conversation on setting a new agenda featuring uh, uh, the president-elect's policy director in a conversation about how they're looking at building a new policy agenda. This is, uh, transitions are always interesting times, particularly transitions when you are switching from um, a party, uh, uh, an administration of one party to an administration of the other. I think we can all agree that this one is perhaps uh, one of the more unique transitions that we've seen with a radically different um, set uh, approach to governing and a radically different policy agenda. So we hope that throughout today's conversations, uh, you'll get a little bit of insight into how uh, they may be going about this. And for those of you that are here watching uh, uh, in the Zoom room, you'll get a chance to ask questions of our panelists throughout the day. Uh, as I mentioned, we're proud to be partnering with Brunswick on this, uh, on this symposium. And so uh, in order to introduce our first panel, uh, I'd like to welcome Molly Miners from Brunswick uh, for a few words. Molly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mo. We are thrilled to partner with Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service on this incredibly relevant topic of presidential transitions. On behalf of myself and the entire Brunswick team, thank you for joining us today. Brunswick is a strategic advisory firm focused on the critical issues where business, politics, and society intersect. And at this time, every four to eight years, our Washington office is particularly focused on how the transition of presidential power will impact those issues. The president-elect is responsible for filling more than 4,000 federal appointments across the White House and government agencies, over 1,200 of which require Senate confirmation. The transition must get up to speed on more than 100 federal agencies in organized staffing and leadership for each. They must establish a policy platform to advance campaign promises, and they must be fully prepared to weather a major crisis. Exactly how they do this is what we will examine here today. On a personal note, January 20th, 2009 was my last day at the Treasury Department after five years of working on illicit finance. I played a small role in helping to draft sections of the transition memos from the Bush administration to the new Obama administration that detailed the work of the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. I wasn't there when the Obama transition team entered the building that day, and I did not envy their enormous task of laying the groundwork to govern. I did envy, however, the experiences and opportunities that were waiting for them. When I went back to work at the Treasury Department in April 2017, the few remaining folks from the transition were filtering out. The magnitude of their hard work was on display as the shift from one administration to the next was well underway at Treasury, just as it had been when I left eight years earlier. Indeed, the process works. A combination of political experts and dedicated career civil servants keep our government running and advancing during a change in administration. Transitions take know-how, they require grit, and they demand steadiness. And I have the great privilege today of introducing two gentlemen that embody all three, Andy Card and John Podesta. Secretary Card has been involved in multiple transition process for multiple administrations. Under President George W. Bush, he served as Secretary of Transportation and later as President, or excuse me, George H. W. Bush, and later as President George W. Bush's first Chief of Staff. John Podesta served as Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton, among several other senior roles, a counselor to President Barack Obama, and co-chaired the Obama-Biden Obama Transition Project. 
I did a little sleuthing around town with friends and former colleagues and even some family members who happen to work for both individuals. About Mr. Podesta, I was told he was, quote, measured, a great manager, smart on all fronts, and willing to listen to all voices, whether senior or junior. As for Secretary Card, I was told, quote, he instilled in us from day one how lucky we were to be at the White House, that we were public servants, we were to be humble, and we were to put the country and the president first. In one word I heard to describe them both was calm. In normal times, a presidential transition can feel unwieldy. Calm, steady leadership is essential to set the tone and chart the course, regardless of party affiliation, and particularly in a global pandemic that requires a virtual transition. We are lucky to have their calming voices here with us today. Their conversation will be moderated by Karen Travers, an undergraduate and graduate school alum of Georgetown, a former GU politics fellow, and by House Correspondent for ABC News. We ask you to join in on the conversation on social media by tagging at GU Politics and at Brunswick Group. And for those in the Zoom room, remember that you can submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom. Please include your name and affiliation. And with that, Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Molly, for that great intro. And thank you, Mo, uh, for bringing us all together. This is going to be a great event today. And we're so excited to have John Podesta and Andy Card joining us uh, for this very relevant, very important conversation. I thought the word that Molly emphasized there of calm was very interesting because I think of what we're seeing right now is maybe anything but calm for a transition. Uh, but I think I want to start off on the nuts and bolts, because you both mentioned that too. And the transitions get a lot of attention for the cabinet secretaries and the big name picks of the White House communications team. That's what we're in the media looking forward to because we want to cover those big stories. But 4,000 jobs have to be filled during this very quick timeline. And wow, 1,200 have to get Senate confirmation. That was surprising even to me. So Secretary Card, let's start with you. I think if you just give our students a sense of how you even do that, how do you fill 4,000 jobs on this tight of a timeline? Where do you even begin? Well, first of all, I want to thank Georgetown and Brunswick, and I thank you, and, and I thank Molly and you, Karen. That's wonderful to be with you. Um, the task is is beyond comprehension almost, almost immediately, but what you have to focus on is staffing the White House first. That's the only institution in government where Congress plays no role. <clears throat> they don't confirm anyone who works at the White House. And that's the team that I think should be addressed first if you're building a, a new administration. I'm really grateful that the president-elect named his chief of staff right out of the box. Ron Klain is very able to do the job and I'm excited for what he's doing. But staffing that White House where the president really does get to pick the people that he wants on the staff. So they all serve at the pleasure of the president for the time being. It's redundant in its insecurity because your job is not to try to please the president. It's actually just do the job, but you serve at the president's pleasure. The second thing is you serve for the time being, which means they don't, there's no guarantee that you're going to last for more than a day. So when you come to work every day at the White House serving the president of the United States, celebrate that day. And at the end of the day, say, thank you for today. I hope there's a tomorrow. But that team is the first team to get in place because that does the homework necessary to make sure the rest of the government that is filled actually lives up to expectations. At the same time that the president elect gets ready to take that oath of office. And we tend to forget the White House drains out on the morning of the inauguration. Mm -hmm. Everybody leaves and a new team comes in and thousands of people are already working right now to make sure that the building drains the right way and is refilled the right way. But that's the job of a, the first job in transition is to get a White House staff in place. Yes, it's good to know who the likely cabinet secretaries will be, but it's even more important, in my opinion, to make sure you have all of the positions at the White House, and some of them have titles that aren't very sexy. Staff secretary doesn't sound like a very sexy title, but it's one of the most important responsibilities in all of government, and it has to be filled in the team that serves in the staff secretary's office 
are responsible for maintaining all of the records of the new president. And that means there is a legal responsibility. And they also are the kind of the policemen for the policy process to make sure nobody is, uh, I'm going to say, end running the system and making sure the president gets good counsel. So that's what I would focus on. It's terribly exciting. And I'm proud to be here with John Podesta, who not only has been a great chief of staff, he's been great at everything that he's done with regard to our great democracy. And John Podesta, it's a perfect intro to the next question to you. Uh, you know, having been in the West Wing and that experience, what does it say about how Joe Biden plans to govern and how he plans to operate his West Wing on January 20th with the people that he's choosing to have around him on day one? Uh, well, uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks, George. Town, thanks Brunswick, and thanks Andy. And by the way, I was the staff secretary on day one in 1993, so I've handed the baton. I'll tell you just a very quick story. I was offered that job about a week before the inauguration. I had never heard of it. I didn't have any idea what it did. And, uh, uh, and I had to call uh, George H.W. Bush's first staff secretary, Jim Sacconi, who's a friend of Andy's, uh, and say, what am I supposed to do? What is this job? So that uh, goes to uh, underscore the point of picking your White House staff early, getting them practicing together, sort of having essentially a shadow policy making process. They have to build a budget that'll be uh, sent to the Hill by February. They have to get on top of this personnel process, which is ongoing in the transition right now, but will soon become the responsibility of the uh, White House Office of Presidential Personnel. And that selection has also been made. But to your question, Karen, the, I think what, what uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris have been doing uh, is selecting these key people. They've got, you know, they have uh, uh, when they announced their uh, communications team that you mentioned, I tweeted women rule. You know, they have this outstanding, diverse team of women communicators who are, are functioning in the communications office, the press secretary, the deputy press secretary, the, uh, the vice president's uh, communications director and press secretary. They're really an outstanding group of people. They all came out uh, for the most part with either campaign experience or served uh, in the Obama administration uh, in senior communication level places. But um, what uh, the most important pick, I think, I agree with Andy, maybe because we were both chiefs of staff, maybe we have a little <laughs> bit of bias, but you got to pick someone who's a strategist to be your chief of staff, to be able to kind of see the whole playing field, to pull both the team together, but also begin to develop the strategies of how you're going to accomplish the promises the president made. And in picking Ron Klain, uh, I think the, uh, the president-elect picks someone who's really uh, has all the experience. He's been in the White House Counsel's Office. He's been the vice president's chief of staff. He was the Ebola czar. He knows the inside workings of the government. Uh, he's uh, building a diverse team of people that look like America. And I think uh, he's uh, attempting, I think, to, to um, get the, you know, pe the kind of wheels turning already as to what they will be doing once they hit noon on January 20th. And they have to be prepared uh, uh, at literally as soon as the, the uh, president takes his hand off the Bible, they have to be ready to govern. And I think he's uh, attempting to do that both in the policy announcements that have been made in the White House and uh, as well as the, you know, other uh, important functions in the White House. And I, I just say one last thing uh, and turn it back to you, which is that uh, he the uh, the uh, idea that you um, in, in essence have to do this while trying to suck in a huge amount of information. Uh, and um, Molly kind of mentioned this. When you get in there, you're trying to extract all this information from the outgoing, uh, what's happening in the agencies and be able to plot and plan against that is an enormous task. And it really, it requires uh, someone who could definitely 
uh, like have that strategic focus, but also make those trains run on time. Yeah. And, and Secretary Card, we're seeing because of the delay with the GSA ascertainment of Joe Biden as the apparent winner and a lack of coordination in some aspects between the Trump White House and the Biden transition team, different from the agencies. Looking back on your experience and, and your, uh, you know, being in the trenches in 2000 and 2001, what concerns you right now about the fact of that delay? What are things that you are worried that aren't happening and that you would give advice to the Biden team coming in on how they can overcome some of those delays and that lack of uh, outreach and connection right now? Well, first of all, I wish there were more transparency, especially with regard to information on distributing the vaccine during a pandemic. And so it's making sure that the president-elect and the team that will be assembled, especially in the White House, is not blindsided by known challenges that were not transferred to the new team. So first of all, I would hope that they would say, we're going to celebrate our democracy. There's a new team that will be coming in. Let's make sure that they are not blindsided on day one, because if they're blindsided on day one, it's probably the fault of the incumbent, not the fault of the successor. And so I would say, be transparent and say, this is what we've done. There's only one president at a time. President Trump is the president right now. At, at noontime on January 20th, there will be a new president. We don't want that new president to drop the baton or stumble out of the gate or fail to get up to speed. So it's transparency. I would start with the pandemic. Obviously, the next area would be national security policy. Uh, there are bad actors around the world that love to take advantage of transitions. And I guarantee that there are some people that are hoping that they can do something that will be disruptive to America's cadence of democracy on that day. And it's happened in the past. We just don't want to be have the president-elect blindsided when he's got the hand on the Bible raising his hand. We want to have a team ready to function literally on the moment's notice uh, at noontime on January 20th with as much information as they can credibly get to do the job. So I would say the pandemic number one and international foreign policy concerns that relate to national security number two. And after that, it's really making sure the team that's coming into the White House is competent to and confident that they can do the job literally at day one. And that's what Ron should be doing right now is he's building a White House staff is have a kind of practice run. What would the first 24 hours be? What would the first two days be? What would the first week be? What will be the first month? What do you want to have done? Have a plan in place. Always be anticipating that there will be, as Mac McClarty says, UFOs, unforeseen occurrences that you'll have to deal with. They come up all the time. But uh, that which you do know, plan for it, because if you have a plan, it's more likely that you will have fewer unintended consequences to the implementation. Well, as a reporter who's going to be there on January 20th and the 21st, I would love to get a sneak peek of those uh, exercises if they're doing it to game out days one through five, just to see and start pre-writing my things. <laughs> but I just want to do a quick follow up on that secretary card. Uh, are you given the president's rhetoric, given the president's public posture and that continued push to overturn the election results, are you worried that the team around him behind the scenes is not doing what they should be doing to help the Biden team come in? Or are they doing it, but in a discreet way? I, I have confidence that they're doing it in a discreet way. And I really have confidence that the senior executive service folks who are in the career staff, uh, they're, they're really the backbone of a transition. It's the career public servants, especially at the highest level, the SES, they, they understand what's happening. Unfortunately, there is no SES in the White House staff. The, the staff drains out. So you're coming in and that's Ron's job is to make sure the staff is ready on day one to do the job. But in terms of the rest of government, I'm confident that there are public servants who will make sure that the information that is needed for the new administration to do a job gets transferred quickly. I'm disappointed at some of the commentary I've heard around distribution of vaccines. I'm disappointed at some of the conversations I've heard around what may be happening in a Pentagon transition. But I, 
I actually think when it comes right down to it, they'll do a good job. George W. Bush, when he was transitioning in, we only had 37 days to do that transition. Now, John Podesta did a great job of making sure that the president-elect, even before he could be called the president-elect, did have a national security briefing and got the PDB so we could start to get ready. But we didn't have the green light to go forward until after the Supreme Court made its ruling. So there were only 37 days of transition, but we worked pretty hard. Vice President Cheney was in charge of the transition team with an executive director named Clay Johnson. They did a good job. But when you get to the White House, you have to build a law department in the council's office, an HR department, which is really a headhunting firm and presidential personnel. You have to have a communications team, not just a press secretary, um, but you've got to have a communications team. You have to have speech writers. You have to have advanced people that will say, whenever the president moves, this is how we'll move. You'll have to have people that liaise with the Secret Service and the military, and you have to people that understand the infrastructure of the White House, like the White House personnel system. How do you hire people to work at the White House? So it's, it's really building a large corporate headquarters with many subsidiaries in one building or three or four buildings, because the White House complex is, it includes the executive office of the president. There's a lot going on. That's what they should be focusing on right now. And they can do it. It's kind of exciting though, but you have to keep your head in the game. And one of the challenges you have is most people who go to work in the White House automatically find that their head grows about four sizes. And you <laughs> want to remind people that, no, just do the job. Be humble in how you do it. And remember that lots of people are watching you. Uh, John Podesta. Now, I know we have two very critical races in Georgia right now, but right. trying to put that aside, because that's what the Biden team is, the, the world they're operating in right now. Joe Biden and his team, as they're trying to determine their cabinet picks and anybody that would need Senate confirmation, let's just make the assumption that it's a Republican controlled Senate. How do they do that right now? How do they balance progressive pressure and interest from the left with putting together a team that can get confirmed, but also with the potential, this is my little curveball, that they could have a Democratic controlled Senate in a couple of weeks? How do you juggle two different lanes like that right now? Well, look, I think what the, the primary uh, motivation right now in trying to build a diverse cabinet is uh, who can do the job. <laughs> and uh, they will anticipate, you know, there's a deep vetting that goes on. Uh, they will anticipate what fights they might run into uh, on, uh, in the Senate uh, when those nominations are forwarded for Senate confirmation. And they are aware it will obviously be easier if if uh, the Democrats pick up the two Georgia Senate races uh, because uh, for uh, no other reason than uh, than Chuck Schumer will be controlling the uh, pace and the and the floor be able to go to the executive calendar schedule the uh, the votes on on cabinet and sub cabinet uh, the tradition is that the Senate is deferential to the president, particularly in his cabinet picks, and those move quickly. But I think uh, tradition's sort of been blown out the window for the last four years. So I think they know they could be in for some fights. Uh, but I, I think they're, uh, th rather than sort of thinking about this as, is this person, you know, Molly Milk Toast, and therefore she'll be confirmed versus a, a fiery progressive. I think they'll think about what is the narrative of the fight that will uh, happen? What will they go after this person for? And do we want to fight about that with the public? One of the things that I think uh, is an essential feature that people don't think about that much in the transition, uh, in addition to picking the personnel developing the policy and strategy around the policy, doing these agency reviews, getting people into the agency to kind of, uh, you know, shake the, uh, the skeleton, see what's, what's happening in there. Uh, the narrative of what the administration wants to do and how it wants to do it is laid down during the course of the transition. And I think when they pick people who might be controversial, they will be thinking, look, do we want the fight? And I think there'll be people who are progressive, 
uh, including my colleague uh, at the Center for American Progress, uh, Neera Tandon, who has drawn some fire. Uh, uh, no one suggested that she uh, is not qualified to run the Office of Management and Budget. She has deep experience across the political spectrum, but they're, they seem to be angry about sometimes she sends out mean tweets. You know, they didn't seem to care about that for the last four years, but all of a sudden, sort of there's the new mean tweet standard. But I think she will get confirmed because she is well qualified for the job. And I think that uh, the White House uh, was, uh, you know, is certainly going to be in there uh, and trying to convince uh, Republican senators as well as Democrats, who I think know her better and 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 uh, have really come to her defense. They they will convince them that this is the absolutely right kind of person for this job. Depth of knowledge, broad experience, right values, fighting for working people. And, you know, uh, uh, that's a fight that in public, they're happy to have. And uh, so we'll, you know, we'll see how it, how it plays out. There might be other issues that, you know, uh, uh, personal finances, something like that, that they look at and they say, no, we're going to have to pass on on this person. We we think they might do a good job serving, but we're not going to unpack all that and unravel that in, in in public. And they'll they'll just kind of move on from that. So you know that's what's going through uh, the vetters right now. That's what's you know being raised to the uh, to the president elect and vice president elect as they make their picks. John, could you just pull back the curtain a little bit on the before the names are announced process? So, you know, how do you on a transition team go about figuring out the fight that might come once that name is is announced? You know, this group, the Biden team, has been very leak free. You know, they're they are a very tight ship. They were like that during the campaign. Uh, we're getting bits and details before these names are officially announced. But for the most part, it's a pretty locked down process. So given that, how do you go and kind of whisper? for campaign on uh, up on Capitol Hill of what do you think about Molly Milk Toast and do you think she could get confirmed? How do you do that without it exploding on you, but also to get good information to determine if you're going to put out a slate of people who have no chance? Yeah, you know, look, I think I think there's a there's a balance there, for, but for the most part, it, particularly at this point, you're going to keep this very tight and inside the operation. Having said that, uh, it's almost like uh, uh, the, these people go through a process that's like uh, the vetting that goes on for a Supreme Court nominee. Mm -hmm. They, you know, there's teams of lawyers going through all of the personal information, all of their public records, all of their tweets, all of their social media droppings. You know, something that probably the students should be thinking about right now. Yes, <laughs> good advice. And, and they will go all the way back all the way back to, uh, you know, literally uh, the w when you were in college to look at uh, anything that could embarrass the president. They, uh, they uh, drill through your uh, personal finances. They look at uh, any uh, litigation you might have been involved with. If you had, you know, a messy divorce, what's that going to, what's going to show up there? Uh, so it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a full, deconstruction of the person, along with, you know, what are the person's talents, but they really, really looking for anything uh, that uh, could be a problem uh, for the incoming team. And then they will render, you know, that goes up through a process. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that they've done something a little bit different in the, in the uh, Biden-Harris transition, which is they've separated uh, the presidential appointments uh, that require Senate confirmation from those that don't. And normally, you know, the division is just by agency as a, and you're looking at a full slate of people down to the, you know, Schedule C appointments. And uh, I think they realized that because the government has been uh, so hollowed out, uh, so kind of decimated in the in, including in the career service, that they need to get into those agencies quickly with people who could begin day one without the requirement of Senate confirmation. So they have a whole team that's looking at uh, putting people in literally on January 20th, 
who can serve at senior levels in a political capacity, provide leadership to the agency, while their people who are who have to be confirmed by the Senate are going through that process as well. And that that uh, I think reflects their view about kind of the state of where things are uh, in the in the government today. Um, and they know they got to have that SWAT team go in really quick. So they've segregated those from the Senate confirmed people. Normally you'd reverse that process. I just want to underline your good advice about the internet living forever and social media. So everybody listening, <laughs> remember that when you're applying for a government job in a couple of years or in many years. Um, Secretary Card, I, I, you know, this is such an interesting time as you have this campaign that is almost two years long and then you get to election day and it's like whoop, quick flip to the next phase. How do transition teams balance um keeping people on in the White House who were part of that campaign, you know, the people that brought you there, the people that got you across the finish line versus people that just know how the government works, because they might be two very different groups of people. So Secretary Card, how did you guys do that uh, back in 2000 and 2001? What you've said is very important and it happens to be real. Yes, there are some people who have the tools necessary to support a campaign, but don't have the tools necessary to help govern. And so you have to manage expectations of the people who worked on the campaign and want to come work at the White House in a particular job. And that's the tough decisions that Ron Klain will have to make. That I hope the president-elect has told Ron, these are the people I want to be around me that I can see regularly. These are some people I want to be around me, but I don't want to see them that often. And these are the people I don't want around me. And then Ron can take that and build a team. But I actually feel very strongly that the president should give empower the chief of staff so that the chief of staff is managing the team the president is not expected to. And I had this rule that... Anytime someone who is appointed by the president, it's a big deal. And there's a caste system, assistant to the president, deputy assistant to the president, special assistant to the president. They're all appointed by the president. And I would say, you can see the president anytime you need to. You better not see the president anytime you want to. And I know you'll cheat and you'll pretend that you've got a real need, but I'm going to scratch at your veneer and find it's a thin, thin, thin veneer of need, of need covering a giant want. And you cannot waste the president's time with your wants. So please see the president anytime you truly need to, because he appointed you, he has confidence in you. But I would like to know before, during, or after, preferably before, no later than after, because we cannot waste the president's time. So filling those positions, recognizing that there are some people that are good at campaigning, some people that are good at governing and helping to govern, and the chief of staff should have a clean sheet of paper to start from, with the exception of those people that the president says, I want this person around me, and then you have to find a way to fit them in. With regard to what John said, Picking the right schedule C's, the political people that can go work in the agency is also critically important, especially during a transition. But the, everyone who takes those responsibilities should understand when a cabinet member is confirmed and takes over the running the department, they may not be suited to work with that cabinet member. So they have to adjust also to the reality that a schedule C is not a guaranteed job. A schedule C is a guaranteed opportunity. And and so, but Schedule C is very important because that gives, and the career public servants are looking for those Schedule Cs to come in and help provide, I'm going to say, a, an understanding of the political pressures that are necessary in order to function closely with the White House staff. We want to get to the student questions, but I want to do one quick one to both of you before we shift it over to the great questions from the Hoyas. Uh, John, we'll start with you. Just with all of the coverage of the transition and the cabinet picks and the staff secretary and the White House inner workings, 
What is the one position that you look back on and say that was so critical and didn't doesn't get enough attention? The one thing that maybe that we're all missing as we look at the landscape right now for the Biden team coming in. So we'll start with John and then Secretary Card, you get a second to think about that. Uh, I would say the person they've been picked who runs the Oval Office operations. Mm -hmm. That's the fancy title. That is the person at the president's door. (laughs) <laughs> that is the person who, when that the want comes to the knocking on the door, says, you don't have an appointment. <laughs> and that is a the, you, people don't much think about that. But there is a gatekeeper right at the door. And the president really needs to trust that person. And the chief of staff needs to know that they're going to have a, a, you know, easy flow of information. And that and then you know, who's the exec sec in NSC, the staff secretary, some of these positions that maybe a uh, cabinet secretary who that you don't hear about that much, but they play vital roles in uh, in making sure that the functioning of the White House, the flow of information, the ability of people to have uh, input into decisions is strong. And therefore, the president gets the full range of opinion and makes good decisions. Mm -hmm. Secretary Card? Well, I had two deputies. Number one, I had Josh Bolton, who was like, he ended up becoming chief of staff, really top-notch policy person, very ethical, knew the president's agenda. He helped set the agenda during the campaign, critically important. Uh, Joe Hagan was deputy chief of staff for operations. He did all the stuff that you don't see. You know, the advance team, the scheduling, the secret places where the president has to go in case of a problem, the relationships with the military and the secret service. Those are very important. The general counsel is critically important because they help set the expectations around ethics. And I happen to feel setting those expectations around ethics is very important, especially at the beginning when you're coming from a campaign, which is kind of let's just do it all to a White House where we have to do it right. Mm -hmm. And so the White House counsel is a critical position, especially with regard to creating a climate of ethics and conscience and doing things legally and consistent with the law. But the staff secretary, I mentioned at the beginning, crit- critically important because I found the staff secretary who is in charge of all of the documents that either go into the Oval Office or come out of the Oval Office. And anything that goes in, we should know about what's going in before it goes in so you can make sure nobody is end running the system. That's the staff secretary. Really important job. And again, people don't think about it. And it's not the most exciting title to have. <laughs> Great. All right. We've got our first question from a student. Christina, we'll let you into the queue. Good morning. Thank you all for being here with us today. My name is Christina Kola, and I'm an executive master's in policy leadership student here at McCourt School of Public Policy. Mr. Podesta, you touched on this just a bit, but specifically, Lindsey Graham has said that they will not vote on an appointment for an attorney general who would make it a point to move forward with investigations into Trump. So with that being said, how does President-elect Biden contend with senators who are either furthering or protecting their own agendas in these appointments? Well, look, I think that uh, the idea that you would set a standard like that is just one more indication of how uh, we've deteriorated the democratic process. That, uh, you know, I don't think that, let me rewind the tape a little bit. I think Biden's been clear that he is going to appoint an attorney general who respects the rule of law and doesn't do the political bidding of of the president. And that's the standard we should hold every attorney general to. Uh, And uh, because the attorney general is the people's lawyer, not the president's lawyer. And uh, if the attorney general meets that standard, uh, then you, we shouldn't be putting conditions on what would you do given circumstances that might develop in the future. So I think it's completely inappropriate uh, for uh, Senator Graham, who chairs the Judiciary Committee, to lay that standard, uh, but not, not it's, it's inappropriate, but not surprising. And uh, 
I think that that they the White House just cannot accept those kinds of red lines. They have to push forward, argue their case to the American people. And I think in the end of the day, there are well-meaning senators on both sides of the aisle who will decide that, you know, that we ought to go back to uh, looking at a person's qualifications and whether they're, uh, you know, have the kind of integrity that, that Andy was describing uh, it, that you want in every person who's going into the government. And, you know, I think that he'll pick an attorney general who should be, uh, will meet that standard, but that's the standard that should be at, uh, at issue. Thank you, Christina. Uh, our next question is from Jordan. Hi there, good morning. Um, thank you both for being here. My name is Jordan Culpepper. I am a first year grad student at the Fletcher School. Um, my question is, is about the civil and military relations. So following um, Biden's pick uh, for uh, Secretary of Defense, there's this growing concern um, that there is a widening gap between civil and military um, uh, relations. Um, and just wanted to know what your thoughts are on, on that. Well, first of all, civilian leadership at, at the Defense Department is the expectation that our founding fathers had. So if we're going to have a general who is going to lead the Department of Defense, they normally, unless they've been out of military, active military service for six years, they have to get a waiver from Congress. And I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't grant a waiver, but we should make sure that whoever is the Secretary of Defense is not actually, actually making a military decision. He's making a civilian decision that will be informed by how the military should implement it. So I, I do feel that it's critically important for us to recognize that the president needs to have really good, wise counsel from people who are in the military and understand it, but he also has to have wise counsel from people who understand the obligations beyond what the Defense Department does. And that's why civilian leadership at the Defense Department is very important. The, the critical role there, though, can be addressed by a strong national security advisor and a national security council that really does conduct an open dialogue with everybody who's involved in the national security issues. Probably the, the best example I can point to was what happened under Brent Scowcroft when he was leading the National Security Council. Uh, Condoleezza Rice obviously did that very well. But Things like that, that's where the concerns that you raise are best addressed. And I think if people are invited to be part of a conversation and not necessarily stay in their own lane, but offer expertise from peripheral vision, one of the challenges that I found as chief of staff, most of the people who work at the White House are hired because they have good tunnel vision. They're experts on something. I found that it was also very important that there be people, especially maybe in the chief of staff's office and the legislative affairs office and the communications office that have peripheral vision. So they understand where the tunnel vision is needed and not being given or where the tunnel vision is blinding you to the reality that the peripheral vision informs. And the same thing goes for what happens at the Defense Department and within the cabinet or within the National Security Council. John, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I agree with what, what Andy said, but I, I think Jordan's question implicates something uh, even a bit broader than General Lawson, who is an impressive person. I, he was the head of CENTCOM when I was at, with Obama in, in, uh, in the second term. And so I saw him and he's, he's, he's quite impressive, but uh, there's an there's a underlying issue, which is the separation of the military from, uh, it, from civilian life. And uh, I think that's a, a, that's a difficult uh, issue to address, but I think it's, a, it's becoming a more uh, prominent question in the way, uh, because there's so few families whose, uh, whose sons and daughters enter the military. Uh, and um, uh, we, I think we don't, we, we need to be really sort of thoughtful about how the perspective of people who are serving uh, is conveyed to the general public and vice versa. Um, 
my my son is a uh, is a major in the Air Force Reserve, and I I you know as I talk to him, getting a perspective of what he's experiencing is actually helpful to me <laughs> in how I'm thinking about the world. But I think um, you know unlike when we had a draft that that is um, less and less true for for most people in the country. They just don't. You know, they respect and I think they honor people in the service, but they don't uh, have enough dialogue with people who are serving. John, thank you for saying that. That is that's exactly right. I have two grandchildren who are in the Navy. So but less than one percent of the American population today really has a connection to direct connection to the military, which is kind of sad. And we've got to do a better job of having an understanding and, and more empathy for the challenges that people in the military have to put up with. Great. We have another question from Andrew. Hello. Thank you both so much for being here. And this has been a very amazing conversation. My question pertains to a lot of the rhetoric that's coming out of the current administration concerning denying the legitimacy of the election, but also where that might follow through. And my question is, should the current Trump administration refuse to concede? You know, is there any uh, anything put in place where an acting administration, after the incoming administration does, you know, take over, chooses to not not see that as viable? Um, I don't believe there's anything ever been like that in the past. You know, what advice would you have for the Biden Harris administration to be able to prepare for should an incumbent say that they refuse to concede? Well, I'll start off by saying, even if he doesn't concede, he will be replaced. Uh, and, and, and the Constitution is very clear about that. And I do not think that it's going to take, you know, an eviction notice be issued to him and get out of the White House. I think that President Trump will leave office. Will he concede? Uh, probably not. But that, that's uh, there is no legal definition to the word that he has to comply with. He doesn't have to say, I concede. He, he will not be the president at noontime on January 20th, 2021. It's just a, the reality. And I think most of us will celebrate the transfer of power because it's not whether you like Donald Trump or, or like Joe Biden, you respect what happened when the voters went to the polls and informed the Electoral College and made their decision. So I want it to happen so that we polish our democracy. I said that at the beginning, we've got a great democracy here. The whole world is watching and they will really watch on inauguration day. I want to see our democracy being the shining example of what all democracy should be. The mark of a great democracy is the transition of power. And I want to do it. And we should be celebrating it. And as citizens, we should work really hard to celebrate that day, even if we may not like the outcome. Well, Andrew, I, I, I would uh, just add a couple of words, which is I agree, I agree with what Andy said. But I think this is a dangerous thing that the president's doing. He's undermining... Uh, He's convincing a big section of the American public that elections are rigged and they don't work. And that's a dangerous uh, thing for our democracy. And I think this is going to have to be actually the sectarianism that is being exacerbated by uh, this post-election period uh, and uh, the tweets, the rally, et cetera, I think is going to be uh, something that the, that Joe Biden is going to have to contend with. And I think uh, if you go back to the Saturday when they announced uh, his, uh, that they had won, that when the networks called the election and they, and they did the, their kind of victory uh, speeches that evening, I think both uh, Vice President-elect Harris and President-elect Biden went out of their way to say, no matter who you voted for, I'm going to fight for you. That is such an important message, but it's going to have to be top of mind that this country has really been divided. And I think, as I said, they're going to be 
millions of people who think this is an illegitimate uh, election. And he's going to have to contend with that. And I think that is largely about how he governs, but it's also how he messages what he's doing to try to dampen down the extreme partisanship uh, that I think we've witnessed in the last couple of weeks. And John, I want to follow up on that. Andrew, that was a great question. Thank you so much that I want to jump in on it too. Uh, You know, if the messaging is one thing, if that outreach in the victory speech is meant to uh, extend a hand to the people that did not vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, are you seeing anything in just the nuts and bolts of how they're doing the transition that seems to be acknowledging the way the president has approached this, you know, the president's rhetoric, has that caused any change to what Joe Biden and his team are doing and saying right now as they build their team? Well, look, you know, I do think it, it, uh, his, the, it's kind of COVID first, first of all. And I think he is trying to message appropriately based on the advice he's getting from really a terrific team of people he's pulled together to advise him uh, on COVID. And I, I, I think he's, uh, again, laying the groundwork for citizenship, really, in, even in his COVID messaging, that it's not that hard to wear a mask when you go outside. You know, you kind of owe that to the people who are living next door to you or, you know, you might encounter in the store, et cetera. And I think that I think that's that's important. You know, he's uh, I expect they, they will find some uh, Republicans who might. Uh, come into the administration. There's, uh, you know, uh, been some uh, reporting or at least rumors about Cindy McCain uh, 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 taking an important role in the administration. And I think there will be others. Uh, But I think primarily what's going on right now is looking at the promises he made. And that that I think is true for every uh, normal president. You look at the promises you made in a campaign and they presidents take those seriously. I think people are cynical about politics and think, you know, they say that it's just the campaign, et cetera. No, the the presidents take what they're promising the American people seriously. And they're trying to convert that into a strategy, whether that's on, uh, on the COVID crisis, on the economic crisis, on dealing with the racial justice crisis we experience uh, and is is ongoing, or whether dealing with the climate crisis. You know, one of the things to look look for, Karen, they're creating a whole new, in addition to appointing uh, Senator Kerry, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, to this position uh, at the international level, they're creating a whole new structure in the White House uh, to run the climate strategy. It's a very important promise that he made to deal with this, to make it the core of his um, uh, recovery. Uh, And it'll be executed by the people he puts in place, how they structure that, its relationship to the National Economic Council. So as you're covering the White House, that's a very important story to be following. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to get one more question into Secretary Card, because it was, I was, as we're listening to all of this, it struck me that you know, in 2000 and 2001, there were a lot of people that came into the George W. Bush administration who were familiar faces and names from the H.W. Bush administration, something you, of course, relate to. Uh, And, you know, when Joe Biden announcing some of these key members of his team, they're also familiar faces from the Obama administration. And he was a little bristly with the framing of this as the third Obama term. Joe Biden obviously has so many decades of experience. He's got this deep well to turn to uh, of, of experts. Is there a risk of turning to the old guard too much and leaving out the next generation coming up? There is some risk, but I actually don't think it's a great risk. I think num- number one, the presidents who are elected end up being elected for the time. They, they kind of fit. And I don't know whether that's divine intervention in our process, but we have confidence, or at least I have confidence, that uh, the right president will be taking the oath of office, and, and so be it. But I do feel it's very good that President-elect Biden does have people 
around him, no, obviously he has tremendous knowledge of how government works with his years and years and years of service, but he's got other people who are contemporary to the knowledge challenges that have to be addressed. And I think they will. I don't expect this to be a rubber stamp of yesterday. I think it's going to be sound advice that will generate lots of debate. I hope that there is a divided Senate. I, I really do hope the Republicans control the Senate because I think kind of a divided Congress makes it all the more exciting to get good policy done. And, and it invites people to stand on the rug of American politics. Look, we've experienced, I grew up at a time when the rug of American politics had more rug than fringe. Today it has more fringe than rug. But I found the best way to govern is from the rug. So I'm inviting people to step off the fringe and get to the rug, recognizing that the fringe goes all the way through the rug. It's the same string. So that's why I'd like to leave that message and say, I'm excited. I don't think this, this is a time for us to say we're returning to yesterday. No, this is definitely we're headed to tomorrow. I think that's a perfect way to end it on an optimistic note, because these are very tumultuous times. I think people are very concerned about everything that's happening in Washington. But we have you both as experts who know this city so well, who both, I think, are feeling pretty good about where things will go. So we really appreciate you both taking the time to do this today. John Podesta, Secretary Andy Card, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. And guess what? There's more to come. Two o'clock, please check back in for the panel discussion on confirmations. And then again, finish out your day at four o'clock with the conversation about building a new agenda in Washington. So thank you all for joining. And we really appreciate everybody taking the time. And of course, Hoya Saxa. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.